and talk about something really beautiful, and that is the Australian Christmas bells. Unfortunately, it's not the happiest story in the world, as our next guest, Kendall Fairweather, is going to tell us. Thanks for joining us, Kendall. You're completing your honours research at the University of Technology, Sydney, I understand. Yes, yes, I am. So I'm looking at Christmas bells. There's four species, and I'm specifically looking at one that occurs just north of Sydney, up into Queensland, up to Fraser Island. And I'm looking at how Christmas bells interact with fire. You know, Kendall, when I read that you were researching Christmas bells, it occurred to me I hadn't seen any for ages and ages. Am I just not looking in the right place or what? Well, it could be a a number of things. Christmas bells, from my surveys and my understanding, are in decline. There's a couple of reasons for that. First, they grow in heathlands, so they're lowlands. There's not large amounts of vegetation. They're pretty easy to clear and build on. So people are chopping them down to put up apartment blocks or in Port Macquarie, they have overrun an area that used to be a very large Christmas bell field in extending their airport. So they tend to be on vaguely flat open country? More often than not, they're in a slightly wet heath or an open forested type area, like like an open eucalyptus woodlands. You get a lot of other native species around them that only grow quite small so two to three meters is sort of the height of the vegetation that they grow in at most. How widely are Christmas bells or were Christmas bells dispersed? Between the four species they went from Fraser Island in Queensland down to about Jervis Bay in New South Wales and then there's one species that covers most of Tasmania. And what are you particularly interested in, in relation to them? I'm looking at one of the multitude of threats that are adding up against Christmas bells, and that's fire and our fire management strategies. We know that Christmas bells are really strongly linked to fire. Their first four years after the environment they're in experiences a fire, they bloom very strongly, so you're getting every plant in an area producing four or five or ten flowers on one stem. But after five years, they stop putting up stems altogether. So I'm looking at that relationship. When you say they stop putting up stems altogether, do the other stems keep on producing flowers? No, it's one stem per season. They're a perennial herb. They pop up a stem around November and they'll have their flowers on that for that season. Sometimes, if the season is a really good one, they might put up a second stem in a season, but otherwise they're not likely to maintain a stem. Once their flowering is done, they've made their seeds for their season, that's the end. They stop putting nutrients in, so that stem will die off. Does this mean they have some kind of underground system like a rhizome sort of thing as opposed to just ordinary roots? They have quite large rhizomes for such a small plant and that allows them to, after fire, really re-sprout. While their their leaves might burn off, they have a lot of energy stored underground so they can pop right back up and take advantage of the space and the nutrients that come with fire. So the plant can exist for maybe 30 years and it's the one rhizome and it will store and store and store and then when it gets that perfect opportunity... It will sprout up, make its flowers for a couple of years, and then it goes back into storage mode. So there would be a point at which the rhizome can no longer sustain itself and it would die off. But I myself and other research that I have read hasn't really identified just how long a rhizome can last underground waiting for its opportunity. So is your research looking at what it may be that fire is contributing? I'm trying to identify what aspect of fire really drives that flowering response of the Christmas bells. So it might be that after a fire, there's a lot of space cleared. That gives them an opportunity to outcompete, particularly due to their rhizomes. They can sprout up really fast into that nice open space. They get lots of light, lots of nutrients, which are enriched in the soil by the fire. They can work off that. They have their rhizomes nice and big. 
so they can, within a couple of months of fire, they can have a whole new plant above ground with five flowers on a stem. So I'm trying to figure out exactly what aspect. Is it the nutrient flush? Is it the space that they get? Is it a particular nutrient that they're taking hold of? Because we know that there are a lot of native Australian species of plant that are specifically targeting certain nutrients because Australian soils are so nutrient poor. My analysis, when I have all my data, will look at what factor is most strongly linked to the growth response and the flowering response of Christmas bells. I'm still in the data collection phase, but what I can say is that it is definitely apparent that the flowering response is in those first three to four years after fire, as well as, at least at my particular site, some really interesting plant correlations that I'm noticing. So the Christmas bells are very strongly associated with xantheria, commonly known as grass trees or black boys. So they appear in the same place a lot of the time, which could be because they have a similar reproductive strategy in that they benefit after fire. They have a rhizoma underground corm as well. Is all the reproduction for Christmas bells asexual? Do they also have seeds? Yes, they do have seeds. A rhizome can only produce genetic identicals. So to propagate the species, they do have sexual reproduction. They're pollinated by bees. A couple of honey eater species also pollinate them. And that allows for the crossing of the pollen with the different plants. And I guess the, the widest spread. Yes, they're largely self-infertile. So even if they get their own pollen on themselves, they're not very likely to make seeds. So they are relying on a cross-pollination by a flying pollinator of some variety. The reproductive cycle is quite beautiful. As the plants bud, their buds point straight up at the sky. And as the flowers begin to bloom, they droop over, hanging a little bit, as you would imagine, like bluebells all around the single stem. And once they have received pollen and they're beginning to create seeds, their seed pod, it looks a little bit like the Mitsubishi symbol in a cross section. In that it's got the three triangle chambers and that points straight down out of the flower and then extends itself to point right back up at the sky. And inside of that, they produce lots of little kidney-shaped seeds that are brown furry seeds. And that seed pod will dry out slowly and burst open in the wind and scatter the seeds that way. So they're quite widely dispersed? Within the local environment. So probably 50 metres at most. They wouldn't be too far because they're not incredibly tall plants, but they'd spread them away from themselves. That would also fit in with their maximum flowering being within a few years of fire because if those little seeds have to make it down into the ground, they don't want to be landing on a massive ground cover. They want to be able to get to the ground. That is true, which is one of the reasons that they might prefer that space. You say they're in decline. Is that across the East Coast or what? Plenty of populations that did exist have been reduced or not managed as well as they could be, I guess which is something that's hard to control from a governmental perspective. You can't control every single species and cater to it. But the species does seem to be in decline, and plenty of people that I've talked to that remember seeing Christmas bells everywhere, like you say, they remember seeing them up in the Blue Mountains, they remember seeing fields and fields of them up on the central coast, and they're just not there anymore. And part of that could be the lack of fire that these areas are receiving because we've got booms in populations. We don't want to have those large fires. We're trying to control them, as well as a reduced amount of controlled burns in certain areas, which is just shifts of governmental policy, which preference the protection of properties as well as large area burns to reduce fire risk in places that like heavy woodlands where you've got a lot of you and that that's mostly a problem for declines in New South Wales as there isn't any government focus however in Queensland they are a protected species so 
people can't just clear land if they're detected there and build on top of them. People can't neglect them. They have to be considered in environmental and economic decisions that are made. So it would be really interesting to see how the populations would shift in New South Wales, where we do have a number of different species, if we were able to protect them as a species by themselves rather than just protect them under the umbrella of a national park or a reserve of some kind where all species are protected. And if your hypothesis is correct in that it does need to be within four years or so of fire and you've got undisturbed populations up there in Queensland, you'd be really able to test that one out. Yeah, so there's some pretty good populations which are fairly isolated on Fraser Island. There is a bit of a conflict there with fire, mostly because there's also ground parrots. So they try to maintain the ground parrot population as well as the Christmas bell population on Fraser Island, which means less frequent burns. But the species can probably survive at about a 10-year burn regime. So that's what a lot of Australian species are adapted to due to fire stick farming conducted by Indigenous Australians over their land. So it would be beneficial for them to have more frequent fires than they're experiencing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be every four years. Probably anywhere up to about 10 to 15 years would still benefit the species in that they would be able to propagate more readily and put down seeds that could grow, form their own corms, and then next fire season they will too flower. Now, a lot of home gardeners love to grow things like flannel flowers and waratahs and so on. How do they go with Christmas bells? Christmas bells are a wee bit fussy about their nutrient intake, so they, they really don't like phosphorus, which is in pretty high quantities in most fertilisers because Australian soils are poor in phosphorus, but the, the Christmas bells don't tolerate high concentrations. So to grow them, you really need a, a really slow-release fertiliser that's only put on in small amounts. There are a couple of articles that have been released by New South Wales government in conjunction with agriculture groups and some of the people I've been working with during my project that do explain the best methods to propagate Christmas bells from existing plant or from seeds. Well, it sounds like a really beautiful project, Kendall. And given the fact that Fraser Island looks like a maybe a worthwhile later study site, you could have a really interesting PhD ahead of you. I could. It would be very nice to get the chance to look at more than just a couple of populations and really compare their needs between the species and how they um, interact differently with certain aspects that I'm looking at for this project. From what you're saying, it's not just the Christmas bells. It would be a whole community of different flora that would come to play. Definitely. The heathlands in which they grow are pretty unique in that they've managed to maintain a lot of uh, native species with few exotic species invasions. Just because they're not very friendly, they're not easy to grab a hold in. So the better protection of Christmas bells would indeed lead to better protection of the heathlands themselves and all those native species which are associated with Christmas bells. That's Kendall Fairweather who's completing her honours research at the University of Technology, Sydney. Thank you so much, Kendall.